Hello, good day, and welcome to where uh, you are listening to us today. It is Tuesday, 6 April 2021. My name is Christian Lindmeyer, and I'm welcoming you to today's global COVID-19 press conference ahead of World Health Day, which we celebrate on 7 April. Therefore, we have a list of very special guests online with us today. Um, I'll start with Her Excellency Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley from Barbados, His Excellency President Carlos Andres Alvarado Quesada from Costa Rica, His Excellency President Hage Gengob from Namibia, and His Excellency President Ilham Aliyev from Azerbaijan, who will join us through a video statement. Simul simultaneous interpretation is provided, provided again in the six official UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, plus we will have Portuguese and Hindi. Now let me introduce the participants in the room here. We have Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Technical Lead on COVID-19, Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products, Dr. Bruce Aylward, Special Advisor to Director General and the Lead on ACT Accelerator, and last but not least, Dr. Rogerio Gaspar, Director for Regulation and Prequalification. Welcome all. Let me now hand over to the Director General for his opening remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Tomorrow is World Health Day. COVID-19 has exacerbated inequalities both between and within countries. While we have all undoubtedly been impacted by the pandemic, the poorest and most marginalized have been hit hardest, both in terms of lives and livelihoods lost. In the year ahead, the world needs to make five vital changes. First, we need to invest in equitable production and access to COVID-19 rapid tests, oxygen treatments, and vaccines between and within countries. At the start of the year, I made a call for every country to start vaccinating health workers and older people in the first 100 days of 2021. This week will mark the 100th day and 190 countries and economies have now started vaccination. COVAX itself has already delivered 36 million doses to 86 countries and economies. Supply chains are up and running and health systems primed. Scaling up production and equitable distribution remains the major barrier to ending the acute stage of this pandemic. It is a travesty that in some countries, health workers and those at risk groups remain completely unvaccinated. The effort to achieve vaccine equity will not stop this week. WHO will continue to call on governments to share vaccine doses and fill the $22.1 billion US dollars gap in the ACT Accelerator for the equitable distribution of vaccines, rapid tests, and therapeutics. We will also look to find new ways to work with manufacturers to boost overall vaccine production. This month, Individuals around the world will also be able to get involved in accelerating vaccine equity via a new fundraising campaign. Developed by the WHO Foundation and a range of partners, the campaign will enable individuals and companies to get one, give one, and close the overall COVID-19 vaccine gap. Further updates will be shared around the launch. Second, there must be a serious investment in primary health care and getting health services to every member of every community. The pandemic has exposed the fragility of our health systems. As essential services were paused, 
many diseases came roaring back. At least half of the world's population still lacks access to essential health services and out-of-pocket expenses on health drive almost 100 million people into poverty each year. As countries move forward post-COVID-19, it will be vital to avoid cuts in public spending on health and other social sectors. Such cuts are likely to increase hardship among already disadvantaged groups. They will weaken health system performance, increase health risks, add to fiscal pressure in the future, and undermine development gains. Instead, governments should meet WHO's recommended target of spending an additional 1% of GDP on primary health care, which is central to improving both equity and efficiency. And they must reduce the global shortfall of 18 million health workers needed to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. Third, prioritize health and social protection. Some countries have already put in place expanded social protection schemes to mitigate the negative impact of the pandemic on poverty, education, nutrition, and overall health. These schemes should be extended until essential services are up and running again. And they must include marginalized groups in planning and implementing future schemes. Fourth, build safe, healthy, and inclusive neighborhoods. City leaders have often been powerful champions for better health, for example, by improving transport systems and water and sanitation facilities. Access to healthy housing in safe neighborhoods is key to achieving health for all. But too often, the lack of basic social services for some communities traps them in a spiral of sickness and insecurity. That must change. Meanwhile, 80% of the world's populations living in extreme poverty are in rural areas where 7 out of 10 people lack access to basic sanitation and water services. So countries must intensify efforts to reach rural communities with health and other basic social services. Finally, data and health information systems must be enhanced. High-quality and timely disaggregated data by sex, wealth, education, ethnicity, race, gender, and place of residence is key to working out where inequities exist and addressing them. Health inequality monitoring has to be an integral part of all national and health information systems. At present, just half the world's countries have any capacity to do this. Today, I'm happy to welcome four heads of state and government to talk about health equity and changes they have made to achieve it. First, her Excellency, Prime Minister Maya Motley of Barbados will start proceedings, and I'm keen to hear of Barbados' experience in the last year and the way ahead. Prime Minister, you have the floor. Prime Minister, we don't hear your sound, please. Thank you very much, my brother, Dr. Tedros. Um, Your Excellency Hage Gengob, President of Namibia, who I have not seen since Nairobi in December 2019. We didn't expect the last year. And to my other brother, Your Excellency Carlos Alvarado Quesada, we spoke a couple months ago, and equally we didn't expect that this journey would be as long as it is. President also um, Aliyev, I want to say how pleasant it is this morning for me to join you because 73 years ago, tomorrow, the World Health Organization would have been formed 
and therefore the commemoration of this day through World Health Day is most appropriate. It would have been appropriate in any scenario, but more relevant and more critical at this point. In the Caribbean, we love our proverbs, short, clever phrases packed with the knowledge to last a lifetime. And I suspect those in Africa are the people from whom we've gotten that love of proverbs. One favorite amongst us, and especially our school teachers in the region, was the one that simply said, Peter pays for Paul and Paul pays for all. And I start here this morning because it is in the recognition that this is a collective battle that we will win the victory. We have come together globally to try and fight a pandemic, but we have to ask ourselves whether we did it in sufficient time and on sufficient scale. We have to ask ourselves whether the five priority actions being focused on this morning, equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, tests, and treatments, both within and between countries is being achieved by the countries of the region and the countries of the world. In the Caribbean, our journey has been torturous over the last year. And Dr. Tedros, I know that you have tried to intervene on numerous occasions to assist us. But the ball reality is that our market size in many instances is simply too small to command the attention of global pharmaceutical companies or indeed of other suppliers of goods in the normal supply chain that will lead for therapeutics distribution, vaccine distribution. And the bottom line is that we have also separately been regarded by the global community as countries that have come out of the depths of poverty and therefore are not deserving of assistance in the traditional ways normally reserved for the most vulnerable. This has made life difficult. We've held on to the promise of COVAX and I've come to you this morning having received the first first tranche of Barbados's vaccines, 3% of our population with respect to the COVID vaccines this morning. But for many globally, this has been a difficult exercise because as we've seen, the spikes can literally grow. We've not had access even when we are prepared to pay. It is against this background, therefore, that the first call to action of equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, tests and treatments within and between countries is one with which we can relate. Secondly, the post-COVID-19 recovery budget and plans to protect and prioritize health and social sectors is one that is truly being felt by the majority of us. And why? The World Bank estimates that global GDP will fall by about 4% this year. Between, with between 40 and 60 million people entering extreme poverty. But our reality also is, as a tourism and travel dependent country, the fall in our GDP last year was not 4%, was not 8%, was not even 12 or 16%. It was 18% threatening to take our country back more than a decade as a result of the loss of production and productive capacity. Regrettably, we continue to be treated globally as one of those countries that is not deserving to concessional capital, even as we face the most difficult crisis that we have faced in a century. These are issues that I hope that the Development Committee of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund that meets later this week, and I have the honor of chairing, will begin to start to put our case for the need to use different criteria for determining how countries should access serious concessional capital most needed now in order to stave off the worst aspects of this pandemic, but more importantly, to deal with the long lasting consequences of the pandemic, which is the social and economic losses that have been sustained in the last decade. The third aspect of the call to action equitable services and infrastructure in all communities, both urban and rural. This is absolutely critical, particularly for the larger countries in the region and globally. But even within a small country such as ours, we have recognized that there are differences and that part of the problem, particularly in the urban setting, is the density of housing that has existed in many instances pre-independence and post-independence, largely because most developing countries in the world have had a significantly broad agenda reflected by many in the SDG agenda 
but a significant broad development agenda that makes it difficult for us to have corrected all of the wrongs that we've needed to correct since independence. It means that in urban communities, the density and the exposure is far greater, regrettably, than in most. But equally, in rural communities, the lack of access to available health care for larger countries, not so much small island developing states, but larger countries remains a major issue. Fourthly, the call to action looks at the issue of primary health care for everyone everywhere. Well, I'd like to make the point that the Caribbean more than most has in the post-independence region in era determined that for us to leave anyone behind is a travesty because our modern settlement was based on discrimination and exclusion and therefore the reality and the imperative of inclusion as well as transparency are absolutely vital if we are to bring our people out of these difficult times in which we live. Finally, better data collection and reporting in countries so that we know where the health equalities are and can address them. My friends, this will not be the last pandemic. There will not be the last one for us. History is replete with examples. And we have to determine what we will learn from our experience over the course of the last year. For many, the 1918-1920 Spanish flu pandemic is too far in the recesses of our recent memory the, um, such that we made fundamental mistakes that we should never allow anyone to make again. Dr. Tedros, you asked me to serve as the co-chair on the One Health Global Initiative, which we have dubbed the slow motion pandemic because we fear that by 2050, more people will die from these super viruses that are antibiotics that we have and other medication are not allowing us to treat sufficiently. I pray that we will take in front, as we would say before, in front takes us. And what do I mean by that? That we will so sensitize the global population that the basic things that we need to take action, the basic policy instruments necessary to remove people from poverty or necessary to remove the juxtaposition of animal and humans in living conditions, not just working conditions, that have given rise to so many diseases that have caused so much death and so much concern in the world. If we do not get the fundamental development equation correct, if we do not work together, if we do not appreciate that we can only work together if we are to achieve a fairer and healthier world, then we run the risk of seeing millions of persons die again in circumstances where different policy responses or similar policy responses with different scale and different um, pace of execution can hopefully have a different result in ensuring that less and less people will become victims to awful epidemics and pandemics. They say politics is the art of repetition, and I said so this morning. Over the course of the last year, we have said the same thing more often than at any other time. There is no magic bullet and there is no magic recipe. The answer is simply for us to work together to get that fairer world and for there to be a level of global moral leadership, recognizing that the singular pursuit of individual countries will not rid the world of the major problems because human beings cannot be contained behind boundaries easily in this globally interdependent world. I pray that we will across the world summon the courage to be able to have coordinated action not just acting together, but coordinated action, such that we are in a position to be able to see the end of this pandemic because we are acting collectively with shutdowns, we're acting collectively with protocols, we're acting collectively with the kinds of policy responses that we now know after a year are critical if we are to put this behind us. I thank the World Health Organization and all of its staff members, the Pan-American Health Organization that serves us in this hemisphere and all of its staff members for continuing to keep the battle on. But I recognize that the ball lies in the courts of the political will of member states of the global community. Thank you and may we rise to that point where we summon the courage for that globally coordinated action 
to make a fairer, healthier world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency Prime Minister Motley. And moral leadership and coordinated action. I fully agree. In Barbados' experience suppressing COVID-19, as well as investing in universal health coverage, is an example for the region and the world. So thank you so much again. I will now turn to His Excellency President Carlos Alvarado of Costa Rica, who has been working closely with WHO on how to ensure that new health technologies are available in all countries through his idea, uh, the setup which we have started implementing uh, together. So, President Alvarado, very nice to see you again, even if it's online, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. My greetings to Your Excellency, Prime Minister Mia Motri from Barbados, uh, President Hage Gengob from Namibia, and to those uh, who are joining us today at the press conference. Indeed, Dr. Tedros, the principles of CTAP, which is the technology for healthcare pool, it's continuing this year, once uh, one year after the start of this pandemic and uh, one day before World Health Day. And this is linked to access to technologies or treatments in a equal and fair way for people throughout the world without any distinction. As uh, Prime Minister Motley was saying, this has a great deal to do with moral leadership and with commitment to progress along this way. This uh, pool can bring along technologies to make them available to all countries and all governments throughout the world. And as Dr. Tedros has said, we need to keep uh, pushing for this. There's already a team set up within the WHO for this. So what we need is governments and the private sector to commit to making it a reality. The first point that was raised by the call of Dr. Tedros on uh, equitable access, I'd like to mention two central subjects. One is linked to the strengthening of social security and universal health care in countries. In Costa Rica, it has been the strength of our universal health care system that has protected us. And this has ensured that we reduce the differences between those on higher and lower incomes because we've ensured that anyone in any part of the country has the same access to testing, vaccine treatment and even to hospitalisation with no distinction on geography. This is difficult and it's expensive, but this is what makes a difference in a world that needs greater equality. And the pandemic, as Dr. Tedros has said, has increased inequalities between countries and within countries. And the inequalities also have an impact on health. Societies which are more unequal are societies which are most violent, and the most violent societies also bring about other phenomena, such as migration or clearly the loss of human life. Another very important point in terms of uh, equitable access is the drive that many countries are making for the international treaty for preparation and response to pandemics. Before COVID-19, the globalised world had not experienced such an impact in the effects of a pandemic. And we need to learn from this experience and be ready. And above all, being ready means being ready for coordinated action and action in solidarity, which does not distinguish between greater or less development, greater or less wealth, whether one is in an urban or rural area. We hope that this treaty will achieve these principles, but we will also work to ensuring that the treaty includes principles so, such as those that we have used in CTAP on the budgets for 
post-COVID recovery, it has remained clear that health is not just a matter of uh, illness. Health care is an all-encompassing subject. We cannot take care of our populations if we don't have guarantees for budgets that provide support to the health sector, community sector and to the infrastructure. It's so important that multilateral organisations can provide means of financing for poor countries, for emerging countries and to assist them in facing up to the medium and long-term effects of the pandemic. Today, developed economies have managed to achieve special packages to help their countries to overcome the effects of COVID, but that's not something that poorer countries can do that. And the fact that there will not be a global recovery from COVID whilst the whole planet is not vaccinated. We won't see economic recovery in the planet if the whole world is not economically vaccinated. So it's extremely important that we look at the subject of financing, whether it's in debt forgiveness or financing in the long term with zero rates or stable rates of interest so that countries can have a margin for manoeuvre and we also need to finance the development and public health infrastructure and recovery and so this is more than a subject of finance it's one of health as well that's why it's so important that we deal with this costa rica has launched the face initiative fund to alleviate economics within the United Nations and also with ECLAC to cover those funds to help emerging economies and to give a specific case the opinions of the qualifying agencies are not taking into account the efforts being made by governments to maintain stable economies and also to assist our populations and every time that there's a negative uh, qualifying uh, qualification that makes uh, access to finance more expensive for our countries we need to take into account the impact of covid when countries are assessed because we have to think about the effects of the pandemic on countries economies in terms of data collection and the assessment of data mentioned by the director general costa rica has a system which is the digital document where each citizen has their digital record and that helps us to keep track of progress whilst maintaining the confidential nature for each citizen but it helps us to have uh, the management of this data so we can deal with this pandemic and future pandemics and i'd also like to turn now to showing my gratitude to the united uh, to the who for all its work and i'd like to thank dr tedros and mention once more our support from costa rica and my support to ensure that treatment diagnoses and vaccines arrive in an equitable and rapid manner to all those who need it. And once more, my greetings, Dr. Tedros. Muchas gracias, Your Excellency President Alvarado. I wholeheartedly agree. Equitably sharing of rapid tests, therapeutics, oxygen and vaccines are key to ending the acute phase of the pandemic. That means tech transfer, sharing know-how, and waiving intellectual property rights. Thank you so much for your leadership on, on this, especially on CTAP. I look forward to now hearing from His Excellency, President Hage Gain Gob of Namibia, on the role of society efforts uh, to tackle COVID-19 and lessons going forward on health equity. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much. 
Your Excellencies, I saw you last in as usual, great to listen to you, Your Excellencies, a great pleasure for me and this important event has they given the devastating pandemic of the world it is time the community of the nation considering this and indeed the ways and means a fairer, healthier world post COVID-19. The fact that the Director General WHO has invited us to be part of this year's event speaks to the urgency of fostering recovery for the Indian world from the economic devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Building a fairer and healthier world will demand to end and concerted action. It will require that we, as members of the human family, stand resolutely together to do everything that is required to return our societies to normalcy. Our people, young and old, have been traumatized. Lives and livelihoods have been disrupted. We are a country that has been deeply scarred. Racism and racial oppression and healthier society. This is an objective that our national liberation struggle. We have the short since the door independence. Our constitution, various pieces of legislation, our domain, policies have been aimed at building an equitable in which no one must feel left out. We in Namibia, we applied equally now didn't get it. We got help from our good friends, China and India, who gave us vaccines so far. We bought, we, we put the advance, we had the advance payment at this, but there is this exclusion. The COVID apartheid is now prevailing. That we already made our deposit. Uh, we get our. Your, your Excellency, Your Excellency, please allow me to uh, come in. The sound is uh, interrupting quite a lot. Is there a chance uh, that you're on the technical side? There can be done something. It seems to be an interruption from your sound signal from your end. Apologies. Maybe we can try again, and uh, if possible, but, and then have your talking points and your um, elaborations that we can at the end share in writing also. Please continue, sir. Your Excellency. What I was trying to say is to address to your number one point, equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, tests and treatment within and between countries. We did apply and paid our deposit to the COVID vaccine. But there is a vaccine apartheid, I'm saying, that we, a small country, have paid deposit, but up to now, we didn't get any vaccine. What we got are vaccines donated by our friends, China and India, and I really thank them for that. Exclusivity, I say, spells Conflict, inclusive it spells harmony. When we are left out, now to get 
that I call apartheid. And we fought against apartheid for many years. After pieces were divided, after adopted our policy of red. Am I audible what is going on? Because we believe that when wounds of the past are healed, he said, laid the foundation, gave our country in work. Every tragedy brings insights. This is the truth. This is true. Your Excellency, when when you restarted, it was go it was okay, and then started to break up. So, I think there is a problem in the audio audio system. Uh, the video is 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 okay, but the audio system is uh, breaking up. So. Uh, we, we, we have heard up to the vaccine, vaccines you got uh, from uh, India and, and China. L later, I think there was some break up again. Then I was talking about vaccine apartheid. I want to make that very clear. Yes. As a man who suffered, and we are here, we deposited, we didn't get any vaccine. Oh. Can I talk? Uh, yeah, still breaking up, but can you go on? Let's see. Okay. Every tragedy of new insights. This is true for the COVID pandemic. But it's speed velocity. The pandemic compelled humanity to act in unison to overcome a common enemy. The public health measures adopted most, if not all countries around the world, demonstrated that the international community did consensus to address a common challenge. It demonstrated that the world we are able to stand together. This, I believe, should be a springboard for the concerted action and common purpose to address other equally important challenges facing humanity. The manner in which NHF responded to the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates that the old adage that says, where there is a will, there is a way. As world leaders, the necessary political will address the devastation brought by meant that we were able to in various aspects such as expanding physical bringing on board professionals repair medical equipment Improving our evaluation system. It meant that we were the provision of hygiene and services. Simultaneously addressed and spread associated with hygiene. A fairer and healthier world also means that our global approach necessarily address the root causes both unfairness and poor health in all their manifestations. The social determinants of health must therefore receive our full attention. In this regard, we must speak not only of availability of opportunities and health services, but of equitable access to essential tools such as COVID-19 vaccines, as I already said. There is no other alternative by the pandemic and by so doing to get a fairer 
and healthier world. Since I'm being sabotaged, I will end here and participate further. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, where there is a will, there is a way. I fully agree. And it's great that Namibia is rolling out vaccines. And uh, I was informed also that through the COVAX facilities, you will have your share in, in, in two weeks. Uh, but I fully agree with the problems we're facing with vaccine equity. And as you know, uh, we said vaccine nationalism or vaccine apartheid, as you said it, it's actually uh, the, the problem uh, with regard to the uh, pandemic response now. Because unless uh, everyone is safe, no one will be uh, safe. Uh, so it's in every nation's uh, interest or in every country's interest to make sure that there is vaccine equity. So I fully agree with you. Uh, I now welcome His Excellency President Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan to reflect on his experience of the pandemic and what's critical to end the acute phase as quickly as possible. He couldn't join us in person, so he sent us a video and uh, please. Every year since 1950, we celebrate a World Health Day on April 7th. But 2021 is a year when the importance of health became even more significant. Having a modern, sustainable, high-quality healthcare system is a priority for every country. Healthcare in Azerbaijan is currently going through a significant change. With implementation of mandatory health insurance, Azerbaijan is strengthening the primary health care, renovating the emergency medical care services, facilitating the digitalization by starting e-health platform and national health accounts within the country. In the meantime, the second year of COVID-19 pandemic is continuing to put enormous pressure on health care system around the world. Azerbaijan was among the first countries to mobilize global efforts against the COVID-19 pandemic. We initiated the summit of the Turkish Council in April 2020, the summit of the non-aligned movement in May 2020, and the special session of the United Nations General Assembly at the level of the heads of state and government in December 2020. Honoring its international responsibility, Azerbaijan has made voluntary contributions to the World Health Organization in the amount of 10 million US dollars. We have also provided direct humanitarian and financial assistance to more than 30 countries in their fight with the coronavirus. This year, World Health Day is dedicated to building a fairer and healthier world, and the question of equal and fair distribution or vaccines is of paramount importance for this cause. Yet, uh, we all are deeply concerned by the unequal and unfair distribution of vaccines among developing and developed countries. Some countries hoard several times more vaccines compared to their actual needs. It is clear that in such circumstances, other countries will face vaccine shortage Supporting fairness in vaccine distribution, Azerbaijan put forward a draft resolution ensuring equitable, affordable, timely, and universal access for all countries to vaccines in response to the coronavirus disease pandemic at the UN Human Rights Council. The resolution was adopted by consensus on March 23rd this year. Azerbaijan was also among the first countries to join and support COVAX initiative. We and the whole international community expect this initiative to become a model of cooperation and solidarity in response to pandemic. Only together we will overcome the pandemic and will return to normal life. Happy World Health Day. Thank you. Thank you, President Aliyev. And I welcome your leadership on calling for equitable, affordable, timely, and universal access to vaccines at the UN Human Rights Council and agree we must do more to ensure vaccines are fairly distributed. 
Again, thank you so much to all heads of states and government for joining us uh, today. We have a lot to do to achieve health equity, but I'm proud to see heads of states leading from the front, which will be key to us strengthening health systems overall and preparing for future pandemics. I thank you. So if you have uh, minutes, few minutes more, if you can join us uh, to, with the Q&A with the media, we would appreciate it. If not, we fully understand. Thank you so much again. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Director General. Uh, let me now open the floor to questions from the media. We have a long list already, but in case you want to get into the queue, please press the raise your hand icon on, the, uh, on your screen. Um, first is John Miller from Reuters. John, please unmute yourself. John, Thanks for taking my question. Uh, it's a uh, you're, you're, are you there? Please go ahead. Okay, today we heard from EMA officials uh, who uh, seem uh, to suggest that uh, there, there, there may well be a link between the AstraZeneca vaccine and the rare uh, complications that occurred. I'm wondering if you can give us an update on the WHO's own progress in sort of assessing the, uh, the potential link and when you expect to make your own uh, announcement public. Thanks. Thank you very much. And let me give the floor to Dr. Rogerio Gaspar, Director for Regulation and Prequalification. Good afternoon. Let me just uh, start by being clear and correct your affirmation uh, or your ma mention to <clears throat> the European Medicines Agency. As you were, as you know, as we were here in the in the meeting already in this press briefing, there was a denial from the European Medicines Agency concerning the existence of the link. What uh, ha happens is that there are a number of committees right now and uh, regulatory agencies and regulatory authorities looking at data, and new data is coming every day and assessing those data. So there's no link for the moment between the vaccine and the thrombolytic events with thrombocytopenia. Of course, it's under evaluation and we wait for uh, some feedback from those committees in the coming days and in coming hours. Just to give a full assessment, probably this is good to give also an assessment with some numbers on it. Uh, the data are coming, as I said, every day. So we are looking at the pharmacovigilance networks globally. And WHO, of course, is uh, relying heavily on the national pharmacovigilance systems, but also on the assessment committees from national regulatory authorities and also from regional regulatory authorities like the European Medicines Agency. The two EULs that were issued uh, by WHO on AstraZeneca based technologies, so uh, one from the manufacturer SK Bio in the Republic of Korea and an authorization um, given, an emergency use authorization given by the Korea, Republic of Korea uh, Regulatory Authority, MFDS, and the second one from SII in India with uh, the correspondent authorization also from the Indian National Regulatory Authorities. Both of them are based on the core clinical data that was submitted by AstraZeneca to the European Medicines Agency. So the regulatory alignment currently is that we'll rely first on the assessment done by the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee by the European Medicines Agency, which started today at 11 o'clock and is supposed to continue tomorrow and probably the day after or not, that will depend on the committee. And we are following that meeting. We have uh, observers on the meeting and we are looking at the data jointly. And at the same time, as you know, the um, Medicines Health Products Regulatory Authority from the United Kingdom, MHRA, is also looking at the same set of data. So what we can say is that the appraisal that we have for the moment, and this is under consideration by the experts, is that the benefit risk assessment for the vaccine is still largely positive. We continue to see a number of events that are rare events linking thrombocytopenia uh, to thrombolytic events. And those rare events are now being categorized in terms of the diagnostics, in terms of the population, in terms of the distribution within the population. And the expert committees will come to decisions in coming hours and coming days about what will be the regulatory status for the vaccine. For 
for the time being, there's no evidence that the benefit risk assessment for the vaccine needs to be changed. And we know from the data coming from countries like the UK and others that the benefits uh, are really important in terms of reduction of the mortality of uh, populations that are being vaccinated. So one important issue to say also because uh, on the media and also on the regulatory committees, we tend to stress too much the risk when we are discussing these issues and we have to do that. We have also at the same time to uh, balance this with the benefit coming from the vaccine. And I think it's important to reiterate this once and once again. Uh, another issue which is also important and that's why WHO is at the same time having a number of sessions, information sessions, groups of experts. Even this morning we had meetings with several regulatory agencies during the midday break. We had a global meeting with experts from different committees for information sharing and disseminating the totality of the information that is available. And in parallel with the current meetings at the European Medicines Agency and the Medicines Health Product Research Authority at the UK, we will convene tomorrow also our Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety that together with other experts we look at those data. So we expect that probably by the end of today or the day after, so Wednesday or Thursday, we might have a fresh conclusive assessment from our experts, but as I'm, I've said already, at the present moment and under the assessment that we have from the data submitted up to yesterday, we are confident that the benefits to risk assessment for the vaccine is largely still positive. Thank you. And let me ask Dr. Simao for... Oh, very quickly, just to complement, because it's, a, it's very important that everyone is aware that, just reinforcing what Dr. Rogério said, that we're collecting data from all regions, right? The data we have so far is the some data observed in the European region. We are working, because millions and millions of AstraZeneca doses have been... Uh, used, distributed and used in, in Latin America and in Africa, in India, in other countries in Asia. So we are very actively, proactively collecting data from different national regulatory authorities. And we also, let me say that we are also in touch with AstraZeneca, because AstraZeneca also has an obligation to, to to report, to monitoring the safety data, and also to report to, to not only to the regulatory authorities, but also to WHO. Thank you very much. Um, the next question goes to Carmen Pound. Political, Carmen, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much for giving me the floor and hi everybody. Um, there have been quite a few reports over the last few days about um, a number of countries, specifically in Africa, that have received doses through COVAX, um, you know, in some cases more than a month ago and either have not deployed them at all or, um, you know, the rollout is super slow um, due to different issues so ranging from hesitancy to, you know, uh, logistical issues. So I wanted to see if there's any um, plan to sort of like ramp up support for deliveries. And if you're looking at like, you know, what are the specific issues um, that are impeding the rollout or faster rollout in those countries? Because I've seen that there are even um, concerns that some of the doses might expire before certain countries are able to, um, you know, inoculate them. Thank you. Let me ask Dr. Bruce Haywood. Carmen, thanks so much for the question. It's so important, right? Our goal in rolling out vaccines is to ensure everywhere in the world no doses or vials lay idle and they're put to work as rapidly as possible. So recognizing the challenge it might pose to roll out these vaccines, because you're targeting different age groups, um, different populations, and we normally do in many countries that are used to childhood vaccination programs. Um, as a result, there was a huge amount of work that uh, was initiated last fall, actually, in, um, in, in uh, uh, especially uh, low, low middle income countries to try and help first with an assessment across all the different parameters parameters that would need to be optimized to roll out these vaccines, then the development of a um, uh, what we call a national uh, vaccines deployment plan across all of these countries, and then a tracking at the international level of by region and by country where countries were in terms of pre 
preparedness. So the most important part of this was a huge amount of work that was done in advance. And uh, credit really goes to a, a group of agencies across uh, the, the uh, WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank, and others that worked together in a concerted uh, effort across countries. So even, of course, the best laid plans are going to have challenges. We've seen that in every country in the world that's uh, introduced these vaccines, whether high income, middle, low income countries, everyone has struggled in rolling out these vaccines. Part of it is logistical, part of it is related to some of the challenges I just spoke of. So in every single country, uh, WHO, UNICEF, but not only, also with a broad range of partners, are working with uh, ministries and with uh, uh, communities to try and optimize the rollouts, rapidly identify what are the bottlenecks. Um, and uh, like you said, even in the question you asked, Cameron, it's a range of issues. Sometimes it's logistical, uh, sometimes it might be hesitancy. We know that one uh, country suspended the use of one vaccine or didn't want to until some of its concerns were, were reconciled. So there's been a whole range of issues, and it really is exactly what you said, a tailored approach uh, in each country to try and help uh, get past uh, any bottlenecks to use so that as rapidly as possible these products can be protecting healthcare workers, um, protecting in particular the older populations and those at highest risk of the most severe disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Aylward. With this, we come to the next. That's Gabriela Sotomayor from Notimex, Mexico. Hola, Christian. Thank you. Um, it's on behalf of Proceso. Uh, 3,400 health workers have died in Mexico. So my question is about the vaccination of health workers. It is clear that the priority is those who are in the first line of fire treating patients with COVID. But what happens with the rest of the health personnel? When should they be vaccinated? In Mexico, for example, 65% of health personnel is under 15 years, 50, 50 years old. And 50% are under 40. So they would be at the end of the line of regular vaccination. So there are around 1 million health workers in this situation. So my question is, what is your recommendation? Because many of them are the first contact of patients with COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll give to Dr. Elwa again, please. Thank you, Christian, and, and thank you, Gabrielle, for the for the uh, for the question. So, um, the uh, uh, clearly, as you've seen, and as we've been discussing now for some weeks, certain populations are at highest risk of being exposed to this disease, and then certain populations at highest risk of severe disease and death. And of course, healthcare workers at the front line are one of the populations that are at highest risk, of course, of being exposed and often having high exposures and repeat repeated exposures to the disease. And that's the reason that the uh, allocation framework uh, that's been put together um, prioritizes the healthcare workers. And that's healthcare workers irrespective of age. It's actually uh, any healthcare workers that are going to be coming into uh, uh, providing frontline services and at risk. Now, in every country, um, there's, there's sometimes making adjustments in terms of, uh, of their goals and whether or not the first goal is going to be to reduce the risk in the uh, oldest population and then the healthcare workers or vice versa or by age across both. So there is some, uh, um, let's say, adaptation or adjustment uh, by country and it's often based on the strength of the healthcare system. It's uh, sometimes based on the clinical outcomes that they're seeing in populations with severe disease in their countries. But uh, in terms of rolling out the healthcare workers and generally this has been irresponsible perspective of the age. But again, as always, Gabrielle, and you highlighted, um, part of the challenge here is just finding the balance uh, with the amount of vaccine that you have available. We're in an extremely, as everyone knows, um, uh, supply constrained situation. So each country has got to make a, a decision sometimes across these populations, how will I be uh, using these vaccines? But uh, again, healthcare workers, as uh, the Director General said repeatedly, and also our guests today um, have to be uh, a top priority as they are um, cannot uh, often uh, protect themselves from being exposed uh, to the disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. With this, we move to Jamil Shad from Estado Sao Paulo. Uh, Jamil, please unmute yourself. 
Hello, can you hear me? All good. Yeah. Um, Dr. Tedros, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, you had a meeting on Saturday with the new Minister of Health of Brazil. My question to you, what was your recommendation to him at this point of time? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, of course, um, uh, we, we have discussed on the measures on the, I mean, starting from the situation, the, how the situation is serious in Brazil. Uh, and um, he started actually by uh, describing the situation, which is really dire, and also what uh, he would like uh, to do. And um, uh, we agreed on the um, uh, way, way forward, but to continue also to engage and committed from our side to help him in, in any way possible. So, um, uh, of course, that was my first meeting with the minister since he was uh, appointed. And we will have uh, follow-up meetings and especially to discuss on details of the actions that should be taken. Uh, there will be expert level, senior expert level uh, engagements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. We move to Jenny Leira Vello from DEVEX. Jenny, please unmute yourself. Thank you for taking my question. Um, WHO released a statement last week on ivermectin, but as you know, um, debates continue in a lot of countries. So I just want to know, um, are there plans to include um, ivermectin in the solidarity trials, or are you considering other drugs um, uh, for for the trials? And also, quickly, um, what the what the criteria criteria are for including treatments in the solidarity trials? Thank you very. Thank you very much, Jenny. Let's see, do we have? Um... Now we were looking to have a colleague online who can answer this. Yep, we do not have a colleague available right now to answer this. We'll take your question offline and reply to you by email. With this, we move to the next, and that would be Jamie Keaton from AP. Jamie, please unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Christian. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this question, I think, is for, is for Bruce. Um, Bruce, today all four countries that were represented at this briefing are expected to get AstraZeneca vaccines from SK Bio, according to Gavi. But many other countries are still expecting AstraZeneca vaccines from SII, um, the Serum Institute. Today we spoke to uh, the CEO, Adar Punawala, and he says that its exports of, for COVAX could now re resume in June, even though Gavi had expressed hopes for a resumption in May as the spike in case counts worsens in India. My question, how concerned are you that COVAX will be facing severe vaccine supply shortages in the coming months from SII and what can be done about it? And how does COVAX survive this major setback that could even last beyond June? Thanks. Dr. Aylert, please. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, I think, first of all, uh, let, let's not speculate on um, what is going to happen in terms of future deliveries from, uh, from, from any of the companies that we're working with. Right now, um, every country we talk to, every company is trying to make sure that they prioritize uh, COVAX and that we get the vaccines that we need. Obviously, if we have an interruption with any one of our um, uh, suppliers for a short time, a month or so, we can find ways to try and manage uh, as best we can with the countries. 
But um, if it prolongs, uh, if it's longer than that, obviously would be a big challenge. Um, we actually have had some good news over the last few days that some of the additional deliveries from SII have been opened up. You'll remember that um, there was a challenge, but there was some deliveries that have been opened up over the last uh, few days, which would be important to all countries being able to start vaccination by the uh, by the end of um, uh, the hundred day period that the Director General has has, uh, has highlighted. But. Um, as you, as you can say, actually, what I meant to make with that point, Jamie, is as you can see, there is a, you know, this is a very fluid situation. We've had multiple reports of sometimes this vaccine supply is going to be cut back by this much or increased by that much. And in fact, um, because of the work by the companies and by the governments to increase supply, additional supplies have come through. Um, you'll remember on the AstraZeneca side where we've had real challenges with supplies over the last few months, there's been a real pickup in deliveries with now over 45 countries supplied just from the AstraZeneca side of the supply. So it's a fluid situation. Um, that's the reason that we try and have as robust a portfolio as possible. Um, as you also know, we have got uh, uh, deals with J&J uh, &J, um, on the Novavax product and other products. So um, part of trying to ensure that if there's a problem with one product, one supplier is making sure that you have other options as well that will come online in the coming uh, uh, weeks and months, uh, hopefully. So a range of things to try and address that, but uh, clearly were there a complete interruption from any supplier, that would be a real problem. And uh, that's the reason we're doing so much work to try and look at, as the Director General said, improving production uh, uh, capacities in the existing suppliers, bringing new suppliers on a board, um, doing the uh, um, emergency use listing uh, assessments for yet additional products. So all of these steps are to try and mitigate any potential uh, interruption in supply from any supplier. Thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. Let me call upon uh, Sophie Mokwena from South Africa BC, SABC. Sophie, please unmute yourself. Uh, my question is around vaccine access, particularly to the developing South or poorer countries. The issue of passports, vaccine passports, is becoming uh, more popular and many people are looking at using that to ensure that they are able to manage the spread of uh, COVID-19. What is the position of the WHO on this vaccine passport and also uh, travel uh, restrictions? And it's linked also to perhaps naming viruses on countries where they are being detected. I mean, the issue of 501YV2 is still being called a South African virus by even very senior experts in science, like Dr. Faki of uh, the United States of America. And is this not stigmatizing a country that has done so much to try and contribute? Thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, Dr. Van Kerkhoff, please. Thanks, Sophie. I could start with the second part of your question. Um, I think you know I've been on record of talking about the naming of these virus variants, and WHO for years has been talking about not including a location as part of a name of a virus or a disease or, or a pathogen or, or the disease caused by that pathogen. And SARS-CoV-2 variants are no different. Um, we continue to see people name the variants country X variant or country Y variant. And we have been working hard actually on developing a nomenclature with a large group of scientists around the world, including the three groups that have developed different nomenclatures for the viruses. I have to say, I have to admit, I foolishly thought this would be a very simple thing to do. I thought it could be done in a week or two, and we're now into our, I think, our second month of, of doing this. We hope to be able to announce the nomenclature very soon. Um, because uh, we need to make sure that any of the names that are used do not further stigmatize a person or a last name or a location inadvertently. Um, and so we're still working on that. But we do hope uh, that countries do not say the South African variant, um, including scientists. Unfortunately, I hear that on many teleconferences that I'm on, and we spend a lot of time talking about these virus variants that are being detected around the world. The more you look, the more you will find. 
And with the increases in genomic sequencing um, that are happening worldwide, there are a lot of regional platforms that are being enhanced to make sure that we can find um, different mutations and different virus variants. There are a lot of research groups that are out there that are studying each of these mutations and the combinations of mutations, which are what these variants are, to determine if there are any changes in transmissibility and severity and any potential impact on our available and future diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. So it is really important that we do have names of these virus variants. Right now, what we're using is the B117, the virus variant first identified in the United Kingdom, the B1351, the virus variant that was first identified in South Africa, and the P1, which is the virus variant that was first detected in Japan but is circulating in Brazil. But there should be no stigma associated with these viruses being detected, um, and unfortunately, we still see that happening. Um, countries that are conducting surveillance, that are carrying out sequencing, that are sharing those sequences on publicly available platforms, that are working with WHO and scientists around the world should not be stigmatized for sharing this information. In fact, we need more of this to be happening worldwide, and we will continue to work with partners to ensure that that, that happens. Dr. Ryan, please. Just on your question regarding certification of vaccination, uh, WHO does support certification of vaccination, be it paper or electronic, as a means of, uh, of providing uh, personal health information to people who are vaccinated uh, 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 and to give them a record of that vaccination, but also for monitoring and evaluation purposes and quality assurance purposes in the health system. So having proper certification and recording of vaccination is very important. That's a different consideration to what those certificates are used for outside the health space. And that would be health certification of vaccination being used to attend work, to attend school, to attend events, to travel nationally or internationally. They are not necessarily related to the health of the individual, uh, but to other factors. Um, and this is a complex issue. It has both uh, uh, considerations around <coughs> how such certification could be um, utilized to uh, reduce transmission, but also around uh, knowledge around the impact of vaccination itself and the, the way in which vaccination may or may not prevent uh, transmission. And there are ethical issues here regarding equity. We already have a huge issue with vaccine equity in the world. Um, the imposition of requirements for uh, certification of vaccination before travel could introduce another layer of such an equity. Uh, if you don't have access to vaccine in a country, then you effectively become isolated as a country as vaccine passports uh, kick in. So there are many, many, many issues. Currently, WHO, or through the Emergency Committee uh, of, uh, of the International Health Regulations, have made temporary recommendations to the Director General that uh, proof of uh, vaccination should not be a requirement. Uh, be required for the purposes of international travel. That group will meet again, I believe, on the 15th of April, and I'm sure that recommendation will be under consideration. In the meantime, we are bringing together our strategic and technical advisory group on infectious hazards uh, with the strategic advisory group on immunization and the ethics advisory group of WHO together to look at these issues. And currently, we have a, an internal working group really pulling together both the scientific data, social data, the ethical data, um, so we can come uh, and get the best possible external advice uh, in order to, um, to advise our member states regarding the use of um, and potential use of uh, vaccine passports, as, as, as you call them. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the last question, we go to Robin Mia from AFP. Robin, please uh, unmute yourself. No, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, within the European Union, uh, some countries like Spain and Germany have relatively low rates of new infections, uh, whilst other countries like Poland and Estonia and, and Hungary have seen some of the highest rates in the world. So my question is, in big, big areas like, say, Brazil or, in this case, the European Union, would it make sense to divert vaccines away from areas of low infection and concentrate on areas of high infection uh, to tackle the fire where it's burning most strongly? Thank you. Thank you very much, Romain. Um, Dr. Simao, please. Let me start, and, and then colleagues can can 
uh, complement. I think it's very important, Robin, to, to, to clarify that vaccines are not necessarily a, a good response to an, an, acute, an acute problem, right? Because vaccines take time to reach immunity and everything else. So it's extremely important that it, when you have a, a lot of community transmission, like we're seeing in some of these countries, that we, what we call the public health measures are taken into account and they are strictly followed. And these are the, the, the mask, uh, consistent use of mask, hand hygiene, uh, ventilation, uh, avoiding crowded uh, crowds, and, and in some specific cases, even lockdowns, and we, as we are seeing in Europe. So we, we, have, we have discussed last year what would be the role in whether we should have a buffer for uh, emergency response related to, to, to spikes in, in transmission. And the decision that we, we did collectively last year was not to do that at this stage, because, like I said, vaccines are not a good response response for immediate uh, situations. What you need in the case of a, of a high transmission in the community is to decrease, decrease uh, the, the possibilities of transmission. That means that decreasing, uh, how do you say, to avoid that people get in touch with each other and avoid crowds and everything else. So, and also there is a, a very, let's say, a, it's a, from the epidemiology perspective, it, it's a, it's a, no one can predict where it's going to be rising next, right? We are seeing that, that even countries that have reached a, a higher vaccination already, we are seeing uh, peaks in communities and peaks in, in cities and, and provinces. So it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen next, where it's the next surge will come. So uh, I think the, the approach right now is that we do, we have, pushing for our vaccine, equitable access to vaccines. And that we are pushing, as was discussed already today, to ensure that people at high risk of infection or people like we mentioned, uh, was mentioned before, the healthcare workers, and also people at higher risk of dying, older people and people with, um, with comorbidities, uh, the, you know, associated diseases, that they are put uh, first. And we think this should happen, that WHO's position that this should happen in all countries, not on specific countries only. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, we're coming to the close. Oh, no, we have an add-on from uh, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Yeah, sorry, sorry. thank you. I do want to come in on this because I think we need to remind everybody that vaccination is one element of the response strategy. And as Mary Angela has said, as you have heard us say repeatedly over and over again, we are accused often of being a broken record, and we will be happy to continue to be this broken record until this pandemic is over. But there are a number of elements, interventions, that can be used that drive down transmission. Globally, we have passed the sixth week in a row where we have seen a consecutive increase in cases around the world. Last week, there were four million new cases reported to WHO, and that is likely an underestimate of the true infections that have been, that have been occurring globally. We are seeing this in all of our regions. There's a slight decline in Europe, but there are still significant increases in a number of countries like France, Turkey, Italy, Ukraine. The U.S. continues to have increased uh, transmission, uh, sorry, the Americas continues to have an increased transmission driven by Brazil, Canada, Argentina, Colombia, the U.S., the same thing in Southeast Asia, a number of countries. We can go on and on. All of this data is in our dashboard, but we continue to see increases in transmission, and we have to remind everyone that there are a number of interventions. This is the tried and true uh, measures, these public health measures that drive transmission down. It's this all of government, all of society approach. It's about knowing where the virus is circulating. So having good strategic testing linked to public health action, ensuring that cases are isolated, that they receive appropriate care. It's contact tracing of contacts of known cases that are in supported quarantine so that they, if they are infected, do not have the possibility to transmit the virus onward. It's about getting into the clinical care pathway early so that individuals who are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus are seen and ha are assessed so that they are treated appropriately and that they are cared for appropriately. 
It is making sure that we have engaged, informed, empowered communities so that they know what they need to do. We understand that the situation is evolving. The situation where you live changes. So following guidance and following the local recommendations is really important. There is very good information that is out there that tells you in the area where you live, in the area where you work, what is safe to do and what is not. At an individual level, it's about physical distancing. It's about wearing a mask. It's about practicing respiratory etiquette, making sure you have clean hands, making sure that you have good ventilation, you avoid crowded areas. All of this matters. This will not change until this pandemic is over. So we cannot rely all on vaccines and vaccinations. We have to continue to put in the individual level measures. We need communities that are supported. Um, if there is a stay at home measure in place, we need governments to support individuals to be at home. Um, all of this still matters. So we will continue to be this broken record and remind the world that there is a strategy out there about suppressing transmission. This guidance, this strategy was issued on the 4th of January last year, and it still is the main, maintained strategy of what we have now to drive transmission down, adding vaccines and vaccination into the mix so that we keep transmission low and we open up our societies. Um, so we cannot forget that there are a number of measures that are in place um, that we have the power to use now. Thank you so much for this, and uh, thank you all for your participation, especially our special guests. We will be sending the audio files right after uh, this, and we hope to include the speech of the President um, of Namibia. With this, let me hand over to Dr. Tedros. Christian, can I oh, just pardon come me. in, because it's just, a, just an update on our previous question regarding ivermectin and uh, of just to confirm that ivermectin is not currently included in the solidarity trial. Um, but we, there are uh, trials uh, ongoing in, in other in other uh, in other countries. Um, the uh, the latest recommendations from WHO uh, in, indicate that the evidence on the use of ivermectin is, is not conclusive, um, and further studies are recommended, particularly in large scale um, randomised controlled trials. Um, the with regard to the process within the solidarity trial, uh, an independent panel of experts. Uh, uses a, a set of defined criteria to pre-select uh, potential drugs into the trial. A prioritization working group then reviews the panel of experts' recommendations, and then finally, what gets through that group goes to the trial steering committee, uh, who uh, then endorse uh, those recommendations and introduce those drugs into the trial. So there are three different independent panel of experts who filter all the potential drugs. There's a series of, of criteria that are used um, around pharmacokinetics, plausible evidence on the me mechanism of action, animal data, safety data, availability of the drug, and, and, and currently a number of drugs are, are under consideration for the trial, including three new drugs, and we've been really trying to get to this, is moving not away from old drugs, because old drugs, have, be have we, as we've seen, like dexamethasone, have proved life-saving, but really beginning to test the, the newer molecules and drugs that are, are coming online. Uh, so we look forward to, uh, to the next uh, selection of, of, of drugs for the Solidarity Trial. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ryan. This was in clarification for a question from DIVX. Um, now with this, let me hand over to the Director General for closing remarks and for thanking the guests. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to invite uh, Her Excellency Prime Minister Motley uh, to say a few words uh, for closing uh, this session. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tedros. I was very engaged during the course of questioning. This is very much still a fluid event for all of us in the world, but it is one that really has the capacity to upend developing countries and we need to ensure that as we fight the pandemic, we also put down the tools to avert a debt crisis, which is potentially on us if we do not get it right. As I speak to you, the chairman of the Caribbean community has regrettably tested positive, Prime Minister Keith Rowley. And I would therefore, I know that you have been in contact with him recently, and I would therefore want to express our deepest concerns for his urgent and quick recovery. But this just drives home the point that until we deal with this with all people, we haven't dealt with it. And I trust and pray 
that these continued works and World Health Day tomorrow will remind us of the urgency for coordinated action and for the urgency of acting together. Um, we look forward to the continued support of WHO and PAHO, particularly for those countries who have limitations in terms of the depth of, of technical resources. And it is for that we continue to pray that we have access because that makes all of the difference to people living. We heard very clearly that global transmission has increased over the last six months, six weeks, sorry. And to that extent, we continue to remind persons that there is no mechanism at the individual level that is too much to protect your lives. From the personal protocols, right back through to what we will do at the global level and at the national level to give people access to vaccines ahead of time, ahead of the battle with the variants. So thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. And I look forward to continuing to work with the World Health Organization and PAHO as we come on top and win this battle against COVID-19 that has done so much to decimate so many. The tail of it, regrettably, is long, and we work towards ensuring that we can reduce the consequences of that tail on our people as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your, Your Excellency. I fully agree with what you said. And also, I join you in expressing my, uh, you know, my um, wishes for fast re recovery to His Excellency, uh, Prime Minister uh, Rowley. Um, I would also like to thank um, all uh, heads of states uh, who have joined today, His Excellency President uh, Gain Gob, His Excellency President Alvarado, and also His Excellency President Aliyev. Uh, thank you uh, so much once, once more, and thank you so much for your leadership. Finally, tomorrow uh, we will publish an additional short list of films for the Health for All Film Festival. This fourth short list is dedicated to health equity. I invite the public to post uh, questions in the comment section of the shortlisted videos. Uh, which are available on YouTube and through the WHO website. Some of your questions will be asked to uh, jurors and winners during the award ceremonies to be streamed on WHO's YouTube channel on 13th May 2021. Thank you to all journalists also, finally, for, for, for joining. and. Um, uh, See you in our upcoming uh, presser. Thank you so much.